Well, the title of this evening's lecture is What is the Kingdom of God? But I shall spend most of my time this evening talking not about the Kingdom of God, but about the Kingdom of Heaven. So I need to begin by explaining why. In the New Testament, as I shall say later, the two terms, Kingdom of God and Kingdom of Heaven, refer to exactly the same thing. There is no difference in meaning between them. In this lecture, however, I shall be using them in a different way from what we find in the New Testament. I shall use the two terms to describe the same thing, but the same thing viewed from two quite different angles. By kingdom of God, I shall mean something that is described in the Bible, especially in the teaching and preaching of Jesus. By kingdom of heaven, I shall mean something that is not necessarily religious, but which is definitely spiritual. I hope that the importance of this distinction will become clear as the lecture proceeds. So I begin with a book entitled, What is the Kingdom of Heaven? by the art critic and writer Arthur Clutton Brock. In it, Clutton Brock imagines an intelligent inquirer seeking an answer to the question, what is the kingdom of heaven? Because he has come across the phrase kingdom of heaven in the teaching of Jesus in the New Testament, the inquirer assumes, quite reasonably, that if he wants to discover what it is, he will find the answer in the teachings of the church, which was founded by Jesus. So he goes to look at the creeds. What does the Apostles' Creed, which we recite at morning and evening prayer, what does that say about the Kingdom of Heaven? It doesn't mention it at all. Well, perhaps the Nicene Creed, which we recite at Holy Communion, says something about it. No, there is no mention here either. So the inquirer turns to the 39 Articles of Religion of the Church of England. These, after all, are the official statement of the doctrine of the Church of England. When I was ordained, I was required to give general assent to them. So what do the Articles of Religion say about the Kingdom of Heaven? Again, and amazingly, there is no mention in the Articles of that subject which was at the centre of the teaching and preaching of Jesus. Just as astonishingly, Article 35, which lists 21 homilies, which, according to the article, should be, quote, read in churches by the ministers diligently and distinctly that they may be understanded of the people, quote, doesn't include any reference to the kingdom of heaven among the titles of the homilies that are listed. In fact, the only mention of the kingdom of heaven that the inquirer finds is in the catechism where it is stated that at baptism a child becomes a child of God and an inheritor of the kingdom of heaven. However, there's no explanation as to what this might mean. Not surprisingly, the inquirer is in deep despair. If he had been able to read German, he might have been directed to the greater catechism of Martin Luther, where, in an exposition of the phrase in the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, Luther explains that the kingdom is something that has been established by the ministry and death of Jesus, that it has destroyed the kingdom of the devil, and that believers are no longer ultimately subject to the kingdom of the devil. However, Clattenbrock does not refer his inquiry to Luther, and neither shall we. But we'll follow Clattenbrock's attempts 
to answer his own question. His main observation is that the kingdom of heaven is a relationship, but not a relationship of use. Now, this clearly needs to be spelled out. We all possess many objects whose value to us is their usefulness. A car owner may be very proud of the model he possesses. It may embrace the latest technology or, alternatively, be a vintage car of great rarity. However, if it doesn't go, if it cannot take him to where he wishes to drive or, in the case of a vintage car, cannot take part in vintage car rallies, it has very little value. Ultimately, its value depends upon its usefulness, on its ability to perform the function for which it was built and designed. The same is true of many other objects we possess, washing machines, mobile telephones, laptops, garden tools. If they do not work, if they are not useful to us, they have little or no value. The kingdom of heaven, says Clattenbrock, is not like this. If we meet it, we experience something that is of no value to us, no use to us. Its value resides in itself. However, it may affect us in different ways. It may make us forget completely about ourselves, about the anxieties that we have at present, or the ambitions that are dominating our lives. It may suddenly relate us to other people in ways that are entirely unselfish and which are governed only by generosity. It may make us feel strangers to ourselves and strangers in the world in which we live. It may set off in our minds searching questions about who we are and what our purpose in life in the world is. Suppose we see a beautiful sunset this can be a deeply moving experience. It is of no practical use to us, and its beauty resides in itself. Yet we may be so moved by what we see that we want to tell someone else so that they can see it also. Our motive in doing this is entirely selfless. We do it not because we want to show that we are more knowledgeable than the person to whom we speak. It is not on our part an exercise of power over someone else. It comes from a sincere desire that someone else should experience the beauty, awe and wonder which we have found so moving. This brings me to the main and central point in this evening's lecture. Towards the end of his book, Clutton Brock describes an occasion on which he says he was offered the kingdom of heaven and refused it. This is what he writes. I was lagging behind my nurse on a walk in my own native West Country in spring when three children ran out of a cottage garden, holding in their hands small branches of sycamore from which they had stripped all but the young bronze-coloured leaves at the top. These branches they offered to me. I can still see them offering them as if they were performing a rite, and they smiled as they offered them. But I looked at them and ran after my nurse without saying a word, and when I turned back to look at them again, they were still standing in the road, holding the branches out, as if they had been disappointed. I had disappointed them, and for days afterwards I kept thinking of them, standing so, and even then I wondered why they seemed to me so pitiful, and myself so mean. As I explain it now, 
the kingdom of heaven was offered to me then in the road, and I refused it. Now, of course, Clattenbrock did not refuse the kingdom of heaven. What he refused was the total unselfish and instinctive act of love and generosity on the part of three small children. And we must remember that children can be as cruel to each other as adults can be. But the act of love and generosity on the part of the children hinted at and in some way expressed the kingdom of heaven. It expressed a realm of right relationships, a dimension of beauty, purity, and loveliness. Now, at this point, I want to return to the matter of the two phrases, kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God. The reason why we have the two phrases is that kingdom of God is found in the gospel of Mark, and kingdom of heaven is what we have in Matthew's gospel. It's usually said, I think correctly, that Matthew's use of heaven is an example of the Jewish reverence for God, which means that instead of saying God, another word such as heaven is used instead. For the writer of Matthew's gospel then, the word heaven was a way of being respectful to God. For our purposes in this lecture, the importance of the phrase kingdom of heaven is that it enables us to talk about the kingdom of God in a non-religious way. The act of offering sycamore branches to Clattenbrock was not a religious action in the sense that it was done in the context of a religious ceremony or religious beliefs. However, if it was not religious in a narrow technical sense, it was certainly spiritual, and I want to develop this idea now in the lecture. Clutton Brock published his book, What is the Kingdom of Heaven, in 1919. Only two years earlier, in 1917, the German theologian Rudolf Otto had published a book entitled The Idea of the Holy, a work that has had a profound influence upon the study of religion in general. Otto described and analysed human experiences in which there was an encounter with what Otto variously called the holy, the holy other, uh, W-H-O-L-L-Y, the holy other, and the numinous. In each case, the result of such an encounter was to make a person aware of being confronted by something that was so much more real than his own being, something that could fill him with awe and wonder. In the example given by Clatton Brock, his refusal of the gift offered made him feel mean. Now, one of the examples used by Otto is from Isaiah chapter 6, where the prophet sees in a vision the exalted Lord and exclaims in awe and wonder, Woe is me, for I am undone, for mine eyes have seen the Lord of hosts, the King. This, of course, is a religious experience. However, in a follow-up book published in 1923, Otto described experiences of the numinous or the holy which were not necessarily religious, but which were certainly spiritual. And I want to say something about several examples. John Ruskin, in his essay of many things, is quoted by Otto. And in it, Ruskin describes how he felt moved as a young man by his encounters with nature. And these are his words. Although there was no definite religious sentiment mingled with it, there was a continual perception of sanctity in the whole of nature, from the slightest thing to the vastest, an instinctive awe mixed with delight, an indefinable thrill, such as we sometimes imagine to indicate the presence 
of a disembodied spirit. I could only feel this perfectly when I was alone, and then it would make me shiver from head to foot with the joy and fear of it. When, after being somewhere away from hills, I first got to the shore of a mountain river, where the brown water circled among the pebbles, or when I first saw the swell of distant land against the sunset, or the first low broken wall covered with mountain moss. I cannot in the least describe the feeling, but I do not think this is my fault nor that of the English language, for I am afraid no feeling is describable. If we had to explain even the sense of bodily hunger to a person who had never felt it, we should be hard put to it for words. And the joy in nature seemed to me to come of a sort of heart hunger, satisfied with the presence of a great and holy spirit. End of quotation. Now, those of you who will remember from last year my aversion to the hymn, All Things Bright and Beautiful, may be surprised to hear me quoting this from Ruskin. Isn't Ruskin advocating all things bright and beautiful here? Definitely not. There is all the difference in the world between trying to prove the existence of God by arguing from the beauty of nature and ignoring its malevolent parts and being confronted by the holy or whatever you want to call it in nature so that, to quote Ruskin, one shivers from head to foot with the joy and fear of it. The most significant phrase in Ruskin's words is when he speaks of, I quote, a sort of heart hunger, which we might interpret as a feeling of incompleteness, of being away from home, of feeling as if in a strange land, yet an experience that suggests that there is something that can satisfy the heart hunger, can make us feel that there is a home or land to which we rightly belong. Such experiences, I would argue, are experiences of the kingdom of heaven, and they are much more common than we might suppose. Paul Tillich, the German theologian who then spent much of his life, of course, in exile in America, relates an experience that he had in the Kaiser Wilhelm Museum in Berlin shortly after he returned from military duty as an army chaplain in the First World War. I stood in front of one of the pictures of the Madonna by Botticelli in a moment that I can only describe as inspiration. There opened to me the sense of what a painting can reveal. It can disclose a new dimension of being, but only when it also has the power to open a corresponding window in the soul. It was only natural for a theologian to ask how this inspiration related to what theology calls inspiration. My former colleague and one-time teacher, John Hayward Thomas, has summarised Tillich's view in the following words. Revelation for Tillich is the occurrence of an event which evokes numinous astonishment, by which he means the feeling of being in the grip of a mystery, yet elated with awe. The occurrence of this whole situation is revelation. The vehicle of revelation is an experience which is charged with the sense of the mystery of existence. The sign event may be historical happenings, happenings in nature or in the lives of saints whose faith and love can become sign events for those who are grasped by their power of creativity. In C.S. Lewis's book, The Pilgrim's Regress, its hero, John, has a vision of an island which sets him on his long quest 
for hope and certainty, and ultimately into Christianity. He finds himself one day, I quote, so far away from home that he was in a part of the road he had never seen before. Then came the sound of a musical instrument from behind, it seemed, very sweet and very short, as if one were plucking of a string or one note of a bell, and after it a full clear voice, and it sounded so high and strange he thought it was very far away, further than a star. The voice said, come. Then John saw that there was a stone wall beside the road in that part, but it had, what he had never seen in a garden wall before, a window. There was no glass in the window and no bars. It was just a square hole in the wall. Through it, he saw a green wood full of primroses. While he strained to grasp it, there came to him from beyond the wood a sweetness and a pang so piercing that he forgot his father's house and his mother. A moment later, he found he was sobbing and the sun had gone in. It seemed to him that a mist which hung at the far end of the wood had parted for a moment, and that through the rift he had seen a calm sea, and in the sea an island, where the smooth turf sloped down unbroken to the bays. He had no inclination to go into the wood, and presently he went home with a sad excitement upon him, repeating to himself a thousand times, I know now what I want. Now, in their biography of C.S. Lewis, Roger Lancelot Green and Walter Hooper accept that The Pilgrim's Regress provides autobiographical information about Lewis's journey into Christian faith. So it may well be that Lewis is using the person of John to describe an experience that he once had even if it is not autobiographical. It is a vivid description of a frequent kind of spiritual experience that sets people on a quest for ultimate meaning in their lives. The Canadian political philosopher Charles Taylor uses the word epiphany to describe art, literature and poetry as expressions of a creative imagination that, I quote, reveals and at the same time defines and completes what it makes manifest. What I want to capture with this term, epiphany, he writes, is just this notion of a work of art as the locus of a manifestation which brings us into the presence of something which is otherwise inaccessible, and which is of the highest moral and spiritual significance. A manifestation, moreover, which also defines or completes something, even as it reveals. Now, I want for a moment to return to Rudolf Otto's 1923 book, in which he collects accounts of experiences of the holy, or whatever we want to call it. And the examples include excerpts from St. Augustine's Confessions, from Martin Luther, and significantly, from Buddhist and Hindu writings and art. The importance of these latter examples from Eastern mystical experience is that it shows that we are dealing with something which reaches far beyond the Jewish Christian tradition, into the experience of humanity as a whole. The importance of this is that it shows that what I'm calling the kingdom of heaven, as opposed for a moment to the kingdom of God, is an indication that we humans are spiritual beings, not in the sense that we are capable of generating spiritual feelings within ourselves, but in the sense that in the world in which we live, there is 
a spiritual dimension or world which is independent of us, a world of harmony and beauty, of right relationships, a world that we may meet from time to time in awe-inspiring moments which move us to ask searching questions about who and what we are. For much of the time, humans are ignorant of this spiritual dimension or explain it away in psychological language and organize their lives and the world with such busyness and such concentration upon technological gadgetry that they become one-dimensional beings. But they are not one-dimensional. And the spiritual experiences of people over vast stretches of time and space provide evidence for the fact that there is a spiritual dimension independent of us which is as real a part of our world as the objects of the physical universe. The realisation of this is important for the church's task. The remainder of these lectures will deal with the kingdom of God, that is, the kingdom of heaven as revealed in the Bible and the mission of Jesus. But the fact of the kingdom of heaven a spiritual dimension that is part of our world and capable of being experienced by humanity of any culture or belief system means that when the gospel is preached, we should feel that we are knocking on doors that may be shut, but which are not locked. That God goes before us and reaches out to humanity in his own ways. Now, if this sounds rather unchristian and too into faith in the modern sense, we must remind ourselves of Acts chapter 17. Paul, you will remember, comes to Athens, where he sees an altar dedicated to the unknown God. And addressing the philosophers and others who gather to hear him, he says, whom ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times beforehand appointed, and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. It is noteworthy that Paul refers to a Greek poet, probably Aratus, who was active in Athens in the early 3rd century BC, and allows that independent of the Jewish Christian revelation, God has made it possible for men to seek after him and find him, although Paul now wishes to declare to his listeners that what they have groped after uncertainly, God has declared openly in Jesus Christ. In his readings in St John's Gospel, Archbishop William Temple comments as follows on the phrase in the prologue to that gospel, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world, John 1, 9, and this is Temple. By the word of God, that is to say by Jesus Christ, Isaiah and Plato and Zoroaster and Buddha and Confucius conceived and uttered such truths as they declared, there is only one divine light, and every man in his measure is enlightened by it." End of quote. There is only one divine light, and every man in his measure is enlightened by it. This does not mean that all religions are the same, patently they are not, 
And it doesn't matter what people believe. Paul and Archbishop Temple would have been scandalised by the suggestion. Not to mention the writer of the opening chapter of John's Gospel, who proclaims that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. But it does put into a wider perspective what we think about the Kingdom of God and its relation to the religious experience of mankind. The Kingdom of God as revealed in the Bible is a particular and special instance of that spiritual world or dimension which is part of God's creation and through which His divine light has and does enlighten those who are open to it. It is important that we never forget this and that we resist all attempts to explain and understand our world and our humanity purely in terms of scientific and technological concepts. There is one final matter to be considered, and that concerns the term kingdom. In English, a kingdom is a piece of territory within which people live. We live in what, for the moment, uh, the Scottish referendum may change this, is the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. When Jesus spoke of the kingdom of God, he used the Arabic word malchuta, which was translated into Greek as basileia in the Gospels. But both malchuta and basileia have the sense of kingship rather than kingdom. And when James Moffat translated the New Testament in the early part of the last century, he translated Basileia as reign rather than kingdom. Thus, Mark 1, 14 to 15 reads in the Moffat translation, After John had been arrested, Jesus went to Galilee preaching the gospel of God. He said, The time has now come, God's reign is near. Repent and leave the gospel. Another translation option would be the rule of God. I was surprised when looking through the modern translations that I possess that none of them, apart from Moffat, seem to have addressed the matter of what exactly Jesus meant by Malchuta. However, for the purposes of these lectures, I shall stay with kingdom. And as I conclude, I shall try to answer a question which may be in the minds of some of you. I hope it is. If the kingdom of God was so central to the preaching and teaching of Jesus, why was Clutton Brock's inquirer unable to find any reference to it in the creeds and in the formularies of the Church of England? The creeds were never intended to be complete statements of Christian belief, but rather to emphasise the central importance of Jesus Christ in the revelation of God. The creeds say nothing about the Bible or the sacraments or about justification by faith or lots of other things. It is unfortunate in a way that they have often been thought of as if they were complete statements of Christian belief. The matter of the formula is, is more complicated, but the simple answer is that over the centuries, the Church came to believe that it was the Kingdom of God on earth, and we'll have to consider that in the last lecture, and that one of its main tasks was to facilitate the salvation of individual men and women. At the Reformation, there was disagreement among Catholic and Protestants about the nature and composition of the Church and of the way of salvation. And these matters became central to the 39 Articles. However, it is regrettable that they omitted all reference to the Kingdom of God. I hope that we have made better progress this evening and that you will join me as we continue our pursuit of this topic during the remainder of Lent. Next week's lecture deals with the kingship of God in the Old Testament. <laughs>